morning and welcome to Villa Rica First United Methodist Church at the Garden. We have three core values, worship, education, and missions. We want to thank you for your ongoing generosity and remind you that you can continue to give by following the online link or by mailing a check into the church office. Bible study will be this Wednesday, one at 10 a.m. and one at 8 p.m. Join us for 1 Samuel chapters 4 through 6. Villarca First masks are available in the church office for $8. We have youth and adult sizes. Our fall tailgate kickoff service will be Sunday, August 30th. Please bring your blankets and chairs to celebrate in the field. Bring your backpacks for prayers over them. Teachers and school system employees will be recognized and prayed over. Our rising kids will be re will receive Bibles. Tailgate Church is scheduled to run through the month of September, 7 p.m. So stay tuned for more details moving back toward the building. Please be in prayer for those affected in our community by COVID-19. And let's say a prayer for our schools. Everyone, let's get together, let's greet our neighbors, and let's show some signs of fellowship. Pass the peace. Hey, Villarica First. Hello, Villarica First United Methodist. Hello, we are First. Hey, Villarica First Love and Mitchell. Hello, Villarica First United Methodist Church. Hello, Villarica First United Methodist Church. Good morning, church family. God has provided us with another Sunday to share in worship. And as we recite the creed this morning, I want you to, uh, if you would, please just think about these words being written in the fifth century. And they are shared by um, numerous Christian denominations. And of course, United Methodists, um, uh, we are one of those. And this is the 21st century, and they are words that have not grown old. Even though if we count the years, they, they, they have um, stood the test of time. So please join me as we prepare our hearts to uh, hear God in the music and hear God in, in the preached word. Join me in the creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
I'm Elise. And I'm Kate. And we're here with the children's moment today. We come up with this idea because all people different on the outside, different skin tones. We have cuts. We we all look different. But in the inside, like stuffed animals, we're filled with God's love. All stuffed animals are filled with fluff. And we're all filled with love, no matter what we look like. God still loves us no matter what color we are, what we are, he loves all of us. <laughs> Dear God, thank you for this day and thank you for all our different skin tones and, and what we look like. Thank you for all our friends and family and thank you for our scars. We know we have them for a reason. And Hi church family, Mike and I sure do miss seeing you. At this time in the service we would like to mention some prayer requests. Praises and congratulations to Luke Waldrop and Holly Daniel on the birth of baby Genevieve. Prayers for them as doctors take extra precautions with some testing being done. Sharon Jeffers' grandson Parks has a heart condition and they're weighing out risks in taking him for follow-up appointments with his heart doctor. Billy Smith is back in the hospital. D.L. Moody is continuing with his immun immunotherapy. Debbie Bradley's grandson, Tyler Smith, was involved in a motorcycle accident and needs our prayers for healing. Irma Andrews is having an echocardiogram tomorrow morning. Also pray for our hospitals and our health care workers, our schools as they make decisions on how to keep their students and staff safe. Pray for our city, our state, and our nation. Let us pray together. Dear Lord, we know that you are the great I Am. We see the flowers and sunshine and know that you are the Creator. You bring us hope when we need it the most. We come to you today with these prayer requests and even the unspoken ones. We ask for healing and comfort. We ask for wisdom when we just don't know what to do next. During these uncertain times, we put our lives in your hands and we will rest on your love and your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 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 Good. 
Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Our text this morning comes from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses, we'll start with 9, and then we will uh, go through 14. So if you would, hear the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord came to him, Elijah. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, tore down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, and the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. What a text. It's a powerful 
image as we consider what it means for Elijah to come to, to the, the mountain of God. He, he finds himself uh, on Mount Horeb, which is also Mount Sinai. This is where God appeared to Moses, where God thundered and the mountain shook and the people down below, they were frightened by the sound that they heard. Frightened to the point to where they wanted Moses and Moses only to continue to talk to God because they really were afraid of the Lord and his power and his might. And so if God had a man to go and, and hear and receive that word, then they were going to send God's man back to that place to hear. So Elijah finds himself, and he finds himself in the same place. It's interesting. Elijah has struggled. He's done some mighty, mighty miracles. He has uh, put the Queen Jezebel and the King Ahab to the test. He has brought their priests, the priests who have turned from Yahweh, the God of Israel, uh, towards the Baals, the, the God Baal who they worshipped at the time, uh, the God that, that Yahweh said, do not turn to them, do not turn to uh, the, these foreign false gods, uh, and yet Israel had turned towards this, uh, and it had made its way into its culture, made its way into its people, made its way into the hearts. This falsity makes its way into the hearts of the Israelites. And when this happens, the people are no longer focused on God. And so this is what, this is what Elijah means, when part of what he means, when he's talking about the people have turned from faithfulness, they have turned from your covenant, they've broken it. And it, it started at the top, the king and the queen uh, and the people and the priests. It was, it was rough. And Elijah had been through a lot. He had attempted to capture the people through the, the ministry of prophecy that God had given him. But he moved past that ministry of, of prophecy and, and got into some interesting working of miracles. Uh, and he had taken it upon himself to do some pretty miraculous and amazing things. And so uh, Elijah is wrestling and struggling. He doesn't feel like his prophetic work has done what it needed to do. And if there's anything that we learn from Scripture... It's that the word of God, as God says himself, it does not return void. And so just because it doesn't meet the expectations of Elijah in those moments, it, that doesn't mean that it's not meeting God's expectations. We pause for just a second and we remember, where does the word of the Lord come from? The word of the Lord comes from the Lord. It's his word. And he gives that word and has an expectation behind that word and with that word, and that expectation is his. So when we try to place our expectation on God's word, and then we come back and we wonder why we're confused or why we're struggling, that's why we placed our expectation on it, not God's. And God wasn't done yet. Elijah, uh, after all this turmoil that you've read about and some that I've talked about, after, after all this turmoil, uh, he's, he's sad. He feels like a failure. It sounds very similar to a little bit of Job, a whole lot of, of Jonah. If you go back and read those stories, especially the story of Jonah, where God's having mercy in that scenario on the, the, the arch enemy of the Israelites, on the Hebrew people. It's the Assyrians. It's, it's the great city of Nineveh. Uh, and Jonah just can't fathom why God would forgive those who are the enemy, the destroyers uh, of his people. And yet it's God who shows grace. It's God's expectations. And so there's Jonah wrestling with expectation too, right? Different expectation than his own. So we find Elijah, uh, Elijah and, and he's, he's got some similarities here, right? He's, he's kind of mimicking part. There's some correlations to part of the story of Jonah. He finds himself as this great leader like Moses and even finds himself uh, on the great mountain of God, Horeb, Mount Sinai, where the presence of the Lord is going to pass by. Now, in order to get there. He's, he's tired. He's, he feels like a failure. He is full of anxiousness, anxiety. Uh, nothing's going right. And even though he's been doing a lot of the right things, some things not quite right, most things right, uh, but it doesn't really matter. He's God's man, and yet he still feels like a failure, right? Some of us can relate with this. We're doing everything right. We're trying uh, so hard to do the right thing, and it just never feels like enough. It never feels right. And so Elijah is sort of racked, if you will, uh, with just this pressure 
Um, and in Bible study this week, as we started First Samuel, we talked about people who carry heavy grief and, and what grief does to you. How that pulls you down, weighs you down, alters things inside of you when you're carrying a lot. Elijah is carrying a lot. And so as he's sort of running to and fro and trying to get things done, God is calling out to his own prophet now trying to speak into the life and the heart and the experience of his own prophet. And how does he do it? Well, in the running, in the confusion, in the struggle of the prophet Elijah, God meets him as he is in the desert, as he is wandering and wondering what the next thing he's supposed to do is. God meets him in the midst of his tiredness, of his anxiety, of his isolation. He feels very isolated. He says, there are none left but me. He's very alone. And if you read before our text, the, the passage there in, in chapter 19 of 1 Kings, what happens? An angel of the Lord meets him with a basic meal, gives him what he needs as he lays down in his tiredness and his frustration and in his exhaustion and meets him right where he's at. Wakes him up from his slumber and says, rise, eat, and, and he eats, but then he lays back down again. And when he lays back down, the angel wakes him back up. Not real sure how soon after, but wakes him back up and says, hey, get up. New it translation. Get up. You got to eat. The journey in front of you is long. Where I'm taking you, what God has for you is long. Just a little commentary, right? And he gets up and he eats again. And he gets back on his journey and he finds himself on the mountain of God. Now, let's look at where Elijah's at again. Tired, frustrated, struggling. He's in a wilderness, uh, both physically and, and right here. He's stressed. Life is heavy. Life is frustrating. And, and he's, he's probably dealing with some anxiety as to what's going on, some nervousness, some worry. Um, he, he could have some doubt. He just he doesn't know what to do next. God is saying two things to him. Now, the first thing has to do with the fact that he's in this wilderness and he's anxious and he's lost. And I know he, he, we all know he wants to hear from God. Um, God gives him what he needs in that moment. He provides that grace and says, get up and eat. And then it, he lays back down. We do that too in our faith, right? We get an encouraging word. We feel like God provides a consolation or a grace. Uh, and then and we receive it, and it helps. Maybe it's a good scripture. Maybe it's a good devotion. Uh, maybe someone has a good word for us, and, and it sort of gets up underneath our burden. And then we lay back down, don't we? We don't give it long enough. We don't grasp to it. We don't stop and go, oh my goodness, God has provided just this supernatural thing. No, we don't. We lay back down. And when we do, um, it, God prompts again. He prompts, he prompts, he prods, he pokes. And he says, no, 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 listen, listen, get up. You need to eat. And so supernaturally, here we have it all over again. We have some of that daily bread. Give us this day that daily bread. We have some manna, that supernatural food that comes from God. Again, here's that Moses thing coming right back at us, right? And God provides for us more inspiration, more encouragement. Uh, a, a, a faithful disciple or a saint of the church who just speaks truth into your life, and you're holding on to those words for today. And, and God wants to give you daily bread, and he wants you to, to live off of and, and have that daily bread. Why? Because it sustains us for the journey. But the journey to what? And that's the question. It's the journey to the mountain, right? It's the journey to the high place where God is found. It's the journey upward, a journey where God desires to meet us. And what God wants to tell Elijah is that you have, here's the commentary, you have seen me in all of the grandeur. You've seen me in the might. You've, you've seen me and, and your predecessors have seen me in the thunder and in the shaking You've seen me in the magic of moments, right? Just that where everything came together just right. And just to sort of skip ahead, something happens. The Lord is passing by, and there is wind, there is earthquake, there is fire. There is shaking ground, shattering rock. The sound has to be deafening. And yet in all three instances, 
as Elijah stands ready, ready to hear the Lord, see the Lord, experience the Lord, the Scripture, the Word of God tells us what? God was not in those things. In these moments in Elijah's life, it wasn't the grandeur he needed to depend on. It wasn't the splendor. It wasn't the spectacular. It wasn't the ooh and the ah that he needed to focus on. What Elijah needed to focus on was not the ooh and the ah, but the wooing of God that comes in the gentleness that he provides when he speaks deeply. And that sort of depth doesn't come from all of the craziness and the shaking and the violence of a, of, of a crackling mountain. It has its times and it has its place. But for the man of God in this instance, what he needed to know is that the daily bread, the long journey ahead, the what's next in his life was not something where he needed to depend upon the miraculous calling down of fire from heaven or the thundering mountain that he may find himself upon. The Lord wanted to pass by inside the heart of Elijah, and he wanted to pass by it, not in grandeur, but in gracefulness. And so what does it say in the text that Elijah hears? He hears a gentle whisper. And I love the way that he describes this. It says that he's there and that all these things are happening. And then it says gentle whisper and he takes his prayer shawl and he pulls it up and he covers his head and he he, he knows in this moment, as he covers over his head, he knows in this moment that he is in a moment of stillness. He is in a moment of presence. He is in a moment of depth. It is the gentle whisper. It is the voice of God that comes to Elijah and comes in a graceful, receiving, deeper, mysterious way. When I was a kid, and I, this is really silly. You may have your own things that you used to do. Uh, when I was nervous, when I was scared, uh, when I was about five, six, seven years old, I can remember just being overwhelmed and I didn't know, and especially when there was a storm, I would go and I would take like one of the big towels, like a beach towel. They were kept in the uh, in the closet downstairs where, where my room was in our little house. And I would take like the biggest towel I could possibly find because it was also kind of heavy. And I'd take that towel and I'd put it over my head and, and, and I would let sort of the darkness that was, that was created in that moment from that towel block, and it would physically block as well, but it would block the light that was just coming at me, uh, and, and it would create a barrier between me and my worry and my anxiety and the, and, and, and the darkness that was trying to get inside. And so, like, as a, as a child, here I was covering my head, and that's when I would take deep breaths, and my heartbeat would slow down, and then I would be calm, and I would be in a place where I felt like I could function just a little bit again. The things that we do when we're children, right? Well, the serious and the gravity of the moment for Elijah, he pulls his prayer shawl, like I said, over his head, and he knows that the voice of the Lord is speaking to him. This is why God asked the question two times. There's lots of different things that your, your Bible, if you have a, an application Bible or, or a study Bible, uh, there'll be different answers that, that, that are in there. Uh, but if you think about it, I want to give you this to think about. Why does God ask him this question twice? Why does God uh, have this powerful moment of crashing rocks and roaring fire and uh, an earthquake and wind? And why, why the shawl? Why this moment? Well, it's because God asked the question the first time, and Elijah was not in the right frame of mind in the right place to hear it. He needed Elijah to know that he wanted to speak and speak deeply and speak past, beyond the normal ways that he would receive the word of God for his life and for his ministry and for his purpose. And so he speaks and says, why have you come here? And in all of his anxiety, in all of his frustration, he just starts to confess and say everything that it is that he needed to say to God. And so God said, tell you what, I, again, new it translation, <laughs> he paraphrased. He says, tell you what, go to the mountain of the Lord. I want you to go up there and I'm going to pass by. And he can only expect, oh my goodness, Moses had the Lord pass by. 
Um, so he goes up to the mountain, and when he gets to the top, he's up there, and all of a sudden, ooh, the wind, but it's not the Lord. He, he says, oh, the earthquake, not the Lord. He says, oh, the fire, not the Lord. You're not listening. And in the silence of that moment, after all of the passing by of nature, then the divine passes by. And what does the sound of the divine sound like for a man who is desperate to hear what's next? What do you have for me, Lord? The sound sounds like silence. It sounds graceful. It sounds like a gentle whisper. I've talked to two teachers this week. Uh, Villa Rica First Methodist uh, was honored to serve this week. Um, uh, Ithaca Elementary School on Wednesday, Bay Springs Middle School on uh, Friday, uh, and it was a joy and a pleasure to be uh, with those teachers, those administrators, to be with them as they're getting ready. And you know already what I heard as I talked with people in various positions within the school, from the top, right, in administration to the hardworking teachers, from, from the, oh my goodness, from the custodians who are, are their, their job, your job right now, it, it, it frightens me, at the level of responsibility that you have right now, and I'm hearing about teachers who are trying to supplement that. Every single person on every level at the school has a level of fear and a level of anxiety. There's a level of worry. There's a level of what is this going to be like. There's a level of what's next. And you're expecting... Um, you're expecting loud roars in, in media, and, and you're expecting the oh no as to what happens if there's exposure or if someone's sick. Will you hear me now, all of you, whether you are a teacher, educator, someone who's associated with the schools, um, or whether you're your parents who are worried about your kids going back to school? Hey, hear me now. Let's take it to the Lord. Let's ask him what's next. And let's remember that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that our heart is the mountain of the Lord where he seeks to pass by. And you are not to look for the loud, wild grandeur of an answer as much as a still, calm submission to the Lord who wants to gently whisper into your heart, into your life, into your fear, into your anxiety, into your frustration. He wants to speak, but be quiet, get quiet, and realize that he wants to provide bread for the journey. And he wants to provide a graceful response that you can hear if you'll get past the wind and the quake and the fire. Wait on the Lord. Go to the mountain. When you get there, let the rush pass by and then let the Spirit of God whisper holy things into your heart. But let your heart be ready. Clear it of distraction. Peace be still, Jesus says to the storm, and get ready to receive. This message today is an encouragement to do just that. It's what I and the church are praying over you is for the Lord to enter into your circumstances, for you to be ready in those circumstances, to hear him say, peace, be still, for him to bring the loud down to a whisper so that the calming, graceful message of God can make its way into the temple that you are, into the heart that you have, which is the mountain of God where he seeks to speak and dwell. May the Lord, in fact, pass by in your life right here, right now, as you prepare and know that he is with you, that he loves you. And so do we, if you need us. Reach out to us. Know that we're praying for you, that we are proud of you, and that the courage that you're showing to either adapt to something virtual or to be face-to-face -face in the midst of a pandemic. Our children need that courage. They need that bravery. And so may you go with God, knowing that God is with you, and so are we. And God bless.